everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Um, welcome to the Wool and the Forest podcast, episode 11. My name is Ducky. I am your host on this channel. And this podcast is about knitting. It is about my love for knitting, my love for all handcrafts, but mostly about knitting. Um, it is about working with wool, working with lovely, sheepy, minimally processed as possible, lovely, rustic, natural wool. Um, it's about my love for this wonderful craft that keeps me happy and keeps my heart light and keeps my life full of woolly, joyous goodness. So welcome everyone. Um, you can find me on Instagram as at Wool and the Forest. My website is woolandtheforest.com and I'm also on Patreon as Wool and the Forest. <laughs> so I think, yes, that's, that's the introduction. I am coming to you from the beautiful, blessed, absolutely magical place where I live uh, with my husband and four small children in a little cottage in the middle of the Olympic National Forest from the Olympic Peninsula, this beautiful, beautiful place that I'm so incredibly blessed to call home, which is in um, the very westernmost tip of Washington State, Washington State in the United States of America. So here I am. I am uh, very new to these parts. I was born and raised in Sri Lanka, but now I'm coming to you in this podcast from the Olympic Peninsula. So what do I need to do? I need to wish you all a very happy new year or uh, as we say in Sri Lanka Suba Alut Aurutak Veva <laughs> so um, in Sri Lanka we don't celebrate the turn of the new year as such on the 31st of December going to the 1st of Jan the new year is traditionally celebrated on um, somewhere in the middle of April we observe the lunar and solar cycle mixed together which is called the luni solar calendar and so the new year is observed more sort of in alignment with the the actual natural world and the cycles of the sun and the moon in relation to the planet rather than as a sort of a man-made calendar but on the 31st anyway now that we live in these modern times if you are in Sri Lanka I would be wishing you Subha Alut Aurutak. So um, I'm wishing you all a wonderful new year. May this new year bring lots of health and well-being and prosperity and abundance and peace and joy and lots and lots of wool <laughs> of course into your life. Um, I want to welcome all the new viewers and subscribers who have arrived on this channel in the last four weeks since I published my last episode, episode 10. Oh my goodness, there are so many new friends here. Welcome every single one of you. I'm so happy to have you here. Um, this channel has been the quietest place for the longest time and after I did that last episode <laughs> it's been a very busy place and I'm so happy to have you all here. I've been having the best time chatting to you all and getting to know you and responding to all your comments on the videos since then. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much for subscribing. Thank you for connecting. Um, to all my old viewers, thank you so much for returning to me and any new people who are finding this just this episode, thank you for being here. I hope you enjoy what you see and if you do, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and to like this video because it really does help uh, for my work, for my videos to be seen and for it to pop up on your feed more. Um, so that also other people who like the same things as you will be able to find this channel. So thank you for doing that. Um, yeah, 
so that's what I wanted to say. I, um, I always have notes with my podcasts because I am a mother of four, one of whom is a tiny little, almost six month old baby, not yet six months, who's still nursing and breastfeeding and he's, he's napping at the moment. So I need to be very organized in order to make sure that I can do this in a, you know, a decent space of time and still be able to tell you everything I need to. So I will be referring to my notes often. <laughs> so first off, um, a few housekeeping matters. So uh, chapters on this episode, there are chapters available. Um, on the bottom of your screen, or on the side of your screen, depending on which device you're viewing the podcast, any mentions, any yarn makers, designers, other podcasters, anyone at all that I mention on the podcast will be linked in the description box below. Now, in terms of how this podcast will go, first off, we will talk, uh, we'll start with a bit of knitting talk. We'll talk about what I'm wearing, some uh, finished objects, uh, what's on my needles, what else, um, some new yarn arrivals and some winter knitting dreamings as I call them, <laughs> winter knitting dreamings. And the next part of the podcast, we will announce the winner. Yes, that is the most important part of my job today is to announce the winner of the last giveaway. In the previous episode, in episode 10, I ran a giveaway for uh, Kristen Drysdale uh, of Scandi Work on Instagram, her wonderful, incredible, important resource for all knitters, the Nordic Knitting Primer. I ran a giveaway for that book and I have drawn the winner of that giveaway and I will make that announcement. After which, the third segment of the podcast will be to run another giveaway. <laughs> I know, but isn't that what this time of year is all about? We're celebrating so many things and I want to celebrate a YouTube milestone, which is 4K subscribers on my channel. I never really <laughs> thought that would happen to me at all because as I said, for the longest time, this has been the quietest channel. Almost no one seemed to be finding my videos. Um, and I didn't mind, you know, it was mostly my friends and um, my wonderful dear supporters on Patreon, without whom, by the way, I could not make any of this available to you as a mother of four, um, living here uh, with my husband, who is also a recent immigrant. Uh, our lives are very much dependent on the support we get from our lovely, lovely patrons, um, who I need to take a moment to thank you. Thank you, my wonderful patrons <laughs> for supporting everything I do. But apart from my patrons and some friends, very few people saw my videos on YouTube. So um, I want to celebrate the arrival of so many new viewers and friends and knitting, uh, knitting buddies <laughs> on YouTube. So I'm running another giveaway. And finally, we will do a bit of knit and chat and catching up on our December, which has been very, very full. So let's jump straight into the podcast and let's talk a little bit about what I'm wearing, which is actually a finished object. Is it the only finished object? No, it's one of two. So first off, this is something that I didn't knit. This wonderful, colorful burst of color is something, it's a shawl, it's a triangular shawl that was knitted for me by a dear friend who lives in India, my dear knitting friend Anjali, um, who uh, is from India, where I also spent a part of my childhood. I actually started school in India. Um, and this gorgeous rainbow is the most squishiest. I have no idea what wool she used, but it is so squishy. Um, I love it. She uh, gifted to me. I think a few years ago, two or three years ago, and often I find it's the one that I reach for the most. Oh, I'll keep that off so I can show you the rest of it. But it is very special to me, not only because Anjali is dear to me, but because it is the only knitted item I have that was knitted for me by someone else. I don't have any other knitted garments that were not knit by me or were gifted to me. So 
yeah this is very special um, so that's one and what I'm wearing is one of my own design as you go sweaters I knitted this a while back but I haven't shared it so I get to share it as a finished object <laughs> cheating a little bit but only a tiny bit um, so this was a design as you go I knitted out of uh, I think it was cascade eco chunky I think it was a while ago but I will put the name of the yarn will probably appear somewhere here soon um, so it was knitted in this cascade highland eco chunky i believe and i didn't even swatch for it i just cast on a few stitches for the neckline and just went with it this is one of the few things i have knitted uh, sweaters that i have knitted top down um, so yeah so it's it was very straightforward i just started in the neck and i had only this stitch pattern that you can see on the yoke that I had an idea of what I was going to do but other than that I just went with it and it has some very interesting construction details um, if you can see let's see which arm will show it better this one might show it better um, it has a two-piece sleeve so basically the whole sweater was started here and it started life as a cardigan by the way and it was seamed up so the sweater started here on the neck worked its way down part of the sleeve, so only half of the sleeve, all the way to the wrist, and then stitches were picked up on the under sleeve and worked back into a gusset under the armhole, uh, like sort of an underarm gusset, which was then connected, and then the rest of the sweater worked down from there. Just no pattern, just stocking at. So let me turn around for you a little bit so you can see it well there so and it's just straightforward yoke at the back of course and it was ended with a eye cord cast off which you can see here on the inside the sweater is fully reversible and it was seamed up down the middle with an I-cord seam. So the entire sweater is reversible. And the I-cord is also on my cuffs, as you can see here. And the I-cord was made out of some of my own hand spun. Um, and then the entire, so it started here, went down, went down, and then was brought right back up the middle. It was so much fun, <laughs> so much fun to make this without having any idea where I was going, what I was doing, and just allowing the moment and the wool and what was already there, the construction that was already there to guide me. And then the entire sweater was dipped in my indigo vat, my organic indigo vat, to get this sort of grayish blue, which I really hope is not causing me to blend into my background. <laughs> Because there's a lot of blue in my studio and often I find if I wear a blue that is too close in shade, I tend to sort of disappear into the background. So that's why I'm wearing my very colorful shawl. It's also helping me keep warm. Um, to help me pop out of my background a little bit. So there we go. <laughs> so that is a finished object. I had a lot of fun doing it. I took photos but I didn't take enough notes to write a pattern maybe someday I can redo it because I really do enjoy wearing this uh, cropped sweater oh and I'm wearing it over something I probably can't show you I'm wearing it over one of my indigo um, overalls so um, I'm if you've seen my previous episodes you will know that I am an indigo artist. I make um, artworks, sort of uh, hangable wall artworks. I also do wearable artworks and I also do things like this, just uh, garments uh, so uh, that are dyed in indigo, mostly made out of cotton and wool hand woven uh, with a great respect for ancestral techniques coming from South Asia where I was raised. Um, and rooting myself in the traditions, the phenomenal textile tradition that goes back thousands of years in that part of the world. So that is what I do, that is my work, it's how I make an income and a living, and it is sort of my entire 
devotion of life is indigo and the textile work that I do. Knitting is my Oh, it's my comfort. <laughs> it's my joy. It's my it's everything that I do to to rest from the very very demanding textile work that otherwise occupies me. So um, yeah, so this this is one of those overalls that I made. It's one of two prototypes um, that I have finalized to make available in the summer through my online boutique. And so I'm wearing from top to bottom layer, all things that I have made myself, which is wonderful, which is lovely. I love it. So that is a finished object. And yes, so as I said, I might be able to in the future make a pattern available. I'm not sure, but I often do this. I will just improvise something and knit and, you know, forget about the pattern because uh, writing knitting patterns is not, not a thing I do as such. I've written a handful, but it's not my main occupation, so when I have time and if I feel really motivated, I will share a pattern, but mostly no. Um, so yes, that is one finished object. Now, what else? Oh yes, I have another finished object to show you. These lovely fingerless mittens. Now this is another one of those improvised knits <laughs> with no pattern, I'm sorry. Um, and I made these for my firstborn daughter. Um, I made them out of this beautiful, beautiful wool. Let me tell you first a little bit about the construction and then the wool. So it was started at the cuff, worked all the way down to the little tippy fingers. Very simple. It starts with a um, ribbing, a little bit of a space between two sets of ribbing where I intended to do some embroidery, but I never did because my daughter didn't want it. She liked it just like this. So there's a bit of ribbing, a bit of plain knitting, a little bit more ribbing. And then, let's see if the camera will focus. And then there are these bobble stitches, which then are connected with the twisted stitches going round. So just twisting this way, twisting the other way. And then another set of baubles and then down to the cuff. Uh, it's not knitted with a gusset because I knew I was knitting it for tiny fingers. So she fits into these beautifully. She's been wearing them all winter, especially in the snow. She loves wearing them because they keep her warm all the way up to her elbows and they resist the snow so well because, oh, look at that. Can you see that? <laughs> I, just, I just noticed that. That's from the stove, from our, from our fireplace, because um, our cottage is heated only by a stove. And these last few weeks, with all the snow play and everything they've been doing, they've been having to go in and out, in and out, and they run in with their mittens and they dry them on the stove, which is the only place you can dry things in the house, in the cottage. So that part has obviously caught a little bit too much heat from the stove and burnt. <laughs> burnt a little but it doesn't seem to have damaged the fibers much just some burnt discoloration anyway this these gorgeous mittens were knitted uh, out of yarn that i got from my dear friend mona who lives in denmark she is at yarrow and yarn on instagram she is a phenomenal incredibly talented natural dyer from Denmark. She works with wool from her own sheep that she hand shears. She's incredibly knowledgeable about sustainable ways of raising sheep and shearing them and keeping them. And not only the wool part, but she's incredibly knowledgeable about natural dyes. She only uses uh, dyes that come from her own dye garden. It's amazing. Um, to me, see, I, I'm, I'm amazed by people who can do both, who, you know, have this knowledge about wool and sheep and how to raise them in ways that are not just sustainable, but are connecting directly to their ancestors and the people who raised sheep and worked that land before them, but also then have this other completely different skill of working with soil of growing uh, colors out of the soil and being able to then use those colors in a way that works so beautifully with their own wool. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. I'm very much a big fan of, of Mona and all the work she does. And I got this uh, wool from her uh, a while back when I, uh, when I 
got some other wool um, uh, for another project and she sent me this just as a as a little addition and oh it's lovely and as my daughter says it takes forever before she can even start to feel the wetness creeping through um, it takes like hours and hours of playing with snow before she can feel the wetness starting to come through and she needs to dry them. So um, real wool dyed with plants by someone who just knows what they're doing. So I love it. Um, that's, you can find her work on Instagram. I'll make sure to make a note of her account. So the fingerless mittens, there was the sweater. Oh, and my unspun crochet baubles. I need to show you those. Here they are. <laughs> now, if you watched any of my Vlogmas episodes, which is what I've been very busy doing um, the last three weeks of December, you will already know these little woolly darlings. These are my unspun crochet baubles. This is what I've really been busy doing for the past few weeks. Um, so if you watch my Vlogmas, you would have heard me talk about them. They're knit out of knitted and yarn. Uh, just a strand of Nutidin and Einband for, on this one and a strand of Nutidin and Holstgarn for the center of this of the baubles of this one. Um, I've made quite a few but I, most of them are still hanging on uh, our driftwood tree in the cottage but um, I brought a couple out to show you into the studio. But the, apart from the center the majority of the the rest of the bauble is crocheted using just a single strand of nitidin, which is really a lot of fun to crochet with. So um, yeah, so I even left a little sort of recipe on how to make these uh, in the last, very last Vlogmas episode that I uploaded. Um, if you wanted, if you were interested, you can go and have a look there. So yes, these lovely things have been keeping me happy in between the busyness of my December period where really I couldn't do a lot of sort of knitting and finishing work as such. So I just I just stopped whatever I was working on and decided just to give, you know, half an hour here, half an hour there just to make these. And I ended up with quite a lovely handful, which are decking and trimming uh, the tree in the cottage right now. So yes, yeah, so that's all the finished projects I have to show you. And here, uh, here's some of the yarn I was using, the, using rather, the Nutidin yarn. Um, this is from one of the dual tone plates um, that I got in the last order of Nutidin. Um, and they were fun to use in these, in these baubles because the two colors kind of go really well together. So I, you know, switched rounds and used up some of those dual tone plates in a really fun way. So that, let's have a look at the time. Yeah. So those are my finished objects. Now on the needles, I only have one single thing on the needles. And that is my mystery project. <laughs> if you watched the last episode of the podcast, you know that I asked you to guess what it was that I was knitting in these triangles and I'm still knitting that and some of you had a very good go at guessing what it was um, that I was trying to make with all these all of these triangles now since the last time we spoke on the podcast I do have quite a few extra triangles that I've worked on oh I guess I have been knitting other things other than crocheted baubles. So I have quite a few of these triangles. And as I said, my husband remains convinced that I'm making bunting, knitted bunting for his birthday, <laughs> which I'm not. As much as I adore and love him, and he is the greatest supporter of everything I do, and I could not do anything, any of this, without his incredible support. As much as all of that, I'm not going to knit him his bunting. <laughs> for his birthday. So this is not knitted bunting and some of you made a very good guess and my dear friend Carrie, who has been a long time viewer, um, actually guessed what it was. So I can reveal what the mystery knit is. It is no longer a mystery. It is going to be 
a uh, sort of like a big old hug, a woolly kimono. That's sort of the idea behind this. So I'm going to use all the triangles and seam them up uh, in a clever way and then turn that entire fabric that is created into a sort of a cropped kimono um, that can be worn open, that can be just tied at the sides, whatever. Something that I know is going to be very useful for me because I am still a breastfeeding mother and probably will be for a while to come, a couple of two, three years to come. I've, I started nursing my babies when my first one was born and it's been it's incredible. It's been almost a decade of breastfeeding. Yeah, it's been intense, beautiful, magical, exhausting, draining, utterly life transforming. But it means that um, my wardrobe has to support that endeavor uh, rather than hinder it. And a lot of the times, even though I love pullovers and I continue to knit them with the you know with the hope of being able to wear them constantly again when my breastfeeding duties are done um, even though I keep I will keep knitting them it's my open things like my kimonos and my knitted cardigans and um, simple things you know like wraparound tops that I keep wearing because it's so easy to nurse the baby that way so this is going to become one that will hold me through this winter and support mama and baby's nursing times yeah so that is still being worked on and um, as I mentioned last time as well it is a very special project in many ways because it is using um, it is using yarn, which are uh, um, wool rather, that is that is tied together by a theme, and the theme is that they all well several themes. One of the themes is that they all come from um, women I know personally, um, except yeah, there's only one exception to that. So women I know personally, women who raise sheep in small farms, um, and um, follow a lot of the same ethos when it comes to uh, land custodianship and caring for the environment and caring for the sheep and a focus on small and sustainable and regenerative practices all of that is included in the people who were involved in in bringing this wool to the world um, all of them except one um, is also dyed in my indigo wool uh, indigo vat rather um, and yes and and all except one of them uh, is just pure wool um, and this one this is the only one that has some silk this is a hand spun blend of silk and uh, Jacobs which is from my dear friend uh, who's a shepherdess who lives very close to me she's a friend and a neighbor um, so yeah so there's a lot of things tying these things together there's North Country Sheviet there's the Jacobs which is my neighbor and dearest friend Jacobs and Silk and there's Corridale too from my lovely 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 friend Carrie um, but the Corridale has all been used up so the only exception to that to some of those themes that tie to are tying everything together here is this one which is a uh, hand spun that I spun out of fiber from Hone Och Ir who are the people who make Nuteden um, and I got the fiber years ago and spun it during um, a very difficult period in my life. So what this lacks in personal connection and sort of personal ties, uh, it makes up for in story because this was knit, uh, this was spun rather, at a time when um, I had just given birth to my third, uh, daughter number three, I have three daughters and one and only son who was born six months ago and after after I gave birth to her my husband and I were separated for some time because he was still wrapping up his work commitments in the Netherlands and we were separated by immigration issues and red tape and the COVID pandemic and travel bans it was a terribly difficult time I was living here alone as a you know a new person to this country myself with three tiny children without the papa anywhere near me and the tiniest of them was uh, was you know just born and I was spinning this at that time with her wrapped on me 
you know, she lived on me, that baby, because we, I, I was completely alone. Oh, here comes another one of my babies, the oldest. Hi. Ali woke up? Yes. Okay. Does Papa need me to come back inside? I don't know whether he needs you, but I'm just telling you. Hello and welcome back. I'm back in the studio. I'm afraid interruptions like that are a natural and I hope, judging from what I heard in the last episode in the comments, a welcome part of this podcast. <laughs> As I said, I am a mama of four little ones. All four of them are with me in the cottage all the time because they're all, um, well, the older two who are of school age are homeschooled slash unschooled and the other two, uh, there's a toddler and a baby. So my life um, very much depends on organizing all of these little things that I do for um, both work and really this, this is pleasure. This is not work. This is probably the only time in my week, once a month, whenever I get to podcast that I get to just sit on my own and talk about something and share something that is so dear to my heart, which is wool, wool, wool is where it is, wool is where my heart lives. <laughs> so um, all of that has to happen around the lives, the busy lives of my little ones. So there's a lot of interruptions, um, but it is getting warmer suddenly. So I was able to jump out of my top, uh, my sweater that I was showing you before and um, I get to show you the inside of it because I've taken it off as I said it's a it's a fully reversible sweater now I understand I was speaking about what was on my needles just before I left but 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 let me get back to reverse time a little bit to finished items and what I was wearing where in that segment of the podcast, if you have been jumping around the podcast, this is what I was wearing at the beginning of the podcast. And it's also a finished project. And I showed the other side of it as I was wearing it. And this is the inside. So you can see it is a fully reversible, fully reversible sweater. Can be worn both this way where the reverse stockinette forms the background. And on the other side, which I was wearing just before, it's the stockinette that forms the background. And this two-piece sleeve detail is actually a little bit more obvious on, I think, on the stockinette side. But there it is, if you can see it. And you know, something I forgot to mention about this two-piece sleeve and why I was sleeve and why I was... Um, inspired to construct it this way uh, is because, let me try to show this a little bit better to you. I'm making a great big bumbling mess of this, aren't I? <laughs> I really am trying to show you how wonderfully this turned out. So let's see if you can see the over sleeve and where the stitches were picked up for the under sleeve, which is the plain stockinette bit. So I was inspired to do a two-piece sleeve um, because of my tailoring background. So I come from a woven textiles and sewing and tailoring uh, sort of background. And um, there was a time when I was madly, madly in love with classical old world tailoring techniques. And I studied it for quite a while, even during my MFA time, um, I uh, studied tailoring specifically. And something that is very common in uh, very fine tailoring is uh, sleeves, which are constructed using two or even often three pieces. So uh, Coco Chanel, Chanel's wool tweed jacket, that famous jacket, that is something that popularized two piece sleeves. But in places like Savile Row in the UK, where there's very fine tailoring tradition going back, you know, a couple of few hundred years even, there uh, using a sleeve that was deconstructed, like the sleeve shape deconstructed into three pieces and then pieced together was very common and still is. So I was um, sort of inspired by that. 
and I wanted to see how it would work simply, purely in a construction sense in knitting because obviously knitted fabric is so fluid, it's so it just melds into each other and the properties of wool, especially the wool I work with, which is all always unprocessed and um, easily feltable and, you know, very pure wool. All those properties of wool and knitting, it kind of tends to make fabric much more, much less rigid, much more flowy and the, the seam lines between where one thing begins and the other is much more malleable. So it didn't it did obviously won't have the same effect as in traditional tailoring where you take a woven piece and where you can make the seams and the intersections between seams much more obvious but still it was a lot of fun to uh to play with that and you know there's there's some parts like where you pick up stitches that that's that's a place where you can really play with um highlighting that two-pieceness or seamedness of the fabric. So that's where my inspiration for that came from. But I took this off while I was in the house because the fire was running, it was very warm, and I thought, oh, you know what? I just want Anjali's lovely shawl around me. And since I'm in it now, I can show you um, this beautiful shawl a little bit better. Isn't it gorgeous? It's so I don't know. I think it's, I know it just looks like a triangular shawl with various gradients of color, but just wearing it is just, oh, knitting friends are the best, aren't they? They're just, I find wearing something that I know that a friend who also loves knitting as much as I do, you know, draping it over myself, it just feels like I get a hug from her every single time I wear it. It's lovely. <laughs> so carrying on, carrying on, but first let's make time for tea. Mm. Mm. I love my tea today. I am drinking my December blend that I make at home using dried corn flowers, dried mandarin peels, all dried over the fireplace, uh, over the stove, and I always add some dried rose petals. But today, I added extra. <laughs> I was very naughty and I put a whole handful of rose petals into my tea today because oh, rose is so, so soothing for the entire nervous system, for the whole body as a whole, but for the nervous system especially, it has this incredible soothing effect. And during my pregnancies, I used rose a lot, but especially with my one and only son, the, the last baby, um, that pregnancy with him, I used it in everything, in my baths, in my teas, in the summer. I made rose syrup and faluda and rose milk. I just wanted it all the time. So now um, that I'm nursing him, I still keep wanting those same scents and aromas and comforting things that were so comforting during the pregnancy. I keep reaching for those. So, mm rose in my tea in this enormous mug <laughs> what is this simply gigantic mug doing in my tiny hands well this mug is not mine this mug belongs to our papa bear there he is there's the big papa bear uh this is from a local potter pottery um, and um yeah, this is his mug because this suits his size and his style, but not mine. I just chose it today. I stole it from him because it holds a simply gigantic quantity. Quantity. <laughs> quantity of tea. <laughs> Sorry. Just ignore me. Just completely ignore me. Goodness, you know, if if you don't like or if you do like, terrible, terrible puns and lots of interruptions, this is the podcast for you. You are my kin. You are welcome here. You are already family. Kick your feet off, sit by the fire. <laughs> you are one of us. Um, terrible puns and lots of um, baby interruptions. That's the way we live here. And enormous, endless mugs of tea. That is also a very important part of life in the gingerbread cottage. <laughs> so moving on, moving on, moving on. 
uh, the next segment of the podcast is knitting dreamings. So if you're like me, in the winter especially, you become especially over ambitious <laughs> in your knitting plans. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about my highly irrational, completely unachievable knitting dreamings. Um, so the first thing on my list is uh, the stern slippers. I spoke about this in the previous episode. Uh, the stern slippers are Norwegian colorwork slippers by Kristen, uh, Kristen Drysdale. It is uh, one of the lovely patterns in her book, The Nordic Knitting Primer. And I really, really, before the end of this season, I want to make a pair for myself. They were meant to be my um, Christmas cast on, but December was just too busy with Vlogmas and with all the festivities and my daughter's birthday. It just has been the craziest December. So I couldn't cast on, but I am going to cast on uh, this month. In fact, let me grab the book so I can quickly show you that pattern again. So I have the book and the stern slippers are right over... <laughs> Oh, ducky. What a mess. Okay, here we go. Here we go. There they are. They are gorgeous. The stern slippers. There they are. Those are the colorwork slippers. They, um, they also use purling um, in colorwork as a technique you get to practice when you knit these slippers. So that's one of my knitting dreamings, which I, I hope will come true uh, because I do have the yarn for them. So I'm going to soon as possible cast on for those slippers. Um, in other knitting dreamings, I have a colorwork jumper, a colorwork sweater. Does anybody use the word jumper anymore? <laughs> or is it just me? I feel like when I was growing up, my mother, you know, my, my mother, grandmothers, my family used to always call what we now call a sweater they would call a jumper and I grew up calling this this thing that is knitted in wool and goes over the top of your head or, or whatever. A cardigan was always a cardigan but a jumper is something you pull over your head. So there's pullover, jumper and I believe it's in the US that I started hearing this word sweater. And for me a sweater has always been something that's kind of you know, belongs to athletic garments like sportswear, you know, that, something that either has a hood or doesn't, kind of something you jog in. <laughs> That's a sweater, but now I've started calling these things sweaters as well. Anyway, an unspun color work pullover um, made out of, I think it's going to be Nutidin. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to, or maybe even bring some Nutidin and some uh, of my lovely beloved Icelandic plotolopi into play. Maybe. We'll see. But there is a plan to uh, bring one of my older uh, colorwork designs into a new life and create a sweater out of that. And my final knitting dreaming, which I think is probably going to happen before the colorwork pullover, <laughs> is this. Now, this is a uh, uh, one of a pair of socks that I knit a while back, which I called the Adivasi socks or the Adivasi sock pattern. I never really wrote down the pattern fully, but I have notes for it. I, um, I knitted this pa uh, these socks for my husband when he was still living in the Netherlands and going like back and forth. And it's knitted from the toe up uh, with a flegal heel and just a very simple but very pretty uh, stranded color work pattern and it ends with a little band of Latvian Latvian uh, braided or Latvian, I think you can call them braided stitches or Latvian braided stitches whatever and a nice deep ribbed cuff. Um, these now belong to my daughter because after a while he wore right through them not after a very long while by the way Oh, that man he's there's a lot of him and you know he is really hard on his socks he really is and he wears through socks in next to no time so I have stopped knitting him socks. <laughs> it's, just, it's, 
it is so sad to see my socks being destroyed in a two three months time so this you can see all the repair work that went into it before i decided you know what no i'm just going to let these felt in the washing machine and do a bit of creative felting and now they have been significantly shrunk in size because these would never fit him um significantly shrunk and felted and now these belong to my oldest daughter she loves wearing them as sort of very thick uh, house socks she just turned nine this year and she has gone through this sudden you know between the nine and eleven they suddenly just they suddenly turn into these <laughs> almost adults and she's having that huge growth spread so she loves wearing these over socks or you know sort of tucking in uh, they're big enough for her to tuck her jammy pants in and she gets a lot of wear out of them now. So Adivasi socks, I really hope that th this is actually something I intend to write as a pattern and publish. Um, and I am doing a version for myself uh, is the plan, the knitting plan, to do a version of these for, uh, for my feet using unspun wool, probably plotilope or a combination of plotilope and neutodon and to finally write up the pattern. Now, this, the name for these socks, Adivasi. Adivasi is a Sinhala word, um, and it refers to uh, a tribal people, a tribal people uh, who live in Sri Lanka, who we consider almost to be sort of the pre-indigenous people of Sri Lanka, if you can say that, because obviously uh, the people of Sri Lanka are indigenous to Sri Lanka, but there are these, uh, there are these tribes, uh, people who have lived almost a hunter-gatherer lifestyle for tens of thousands of years, who we know have, were there before um, sort of the people with the more Indian, South Asian genetics started to occupy the land, the island that we call Sri Lanka now. So uh, the Adivasi people, um, uh, this was sort of a, a dedication to both them and to the lifestyle that they live because they're wanderers and um, at the time my husband was very much a wanderer who was separated from his family and he was wandering between his home and his had been home you know so these were to keep him safe through his wanderings and um, yeah so that's why they were called the Adivasi socks anyway hopefully this is a pattern that you will get to see maybe for this winter season. I really hope I can make it available for you all to knit with. So you can try your hand at a simple stranded colour work unspun sock pattern. And yes, you can make socks out of unspun wool. Um, you really can, especially when there's some plotilope involved, all that wonderful Icelandic strength. Yes, you definitely can. So that is my final knitting dreaming or my knitting plan for the winter. Now let's carry on. You know, I had a question for other podcasters actually. I used to be a single project girl, but I have found that since starting podcasting, I suddenly have more than one project on my hands. Is this something that happens when you start podcasting? Is there like a, a pressure to show lots of finished items just because you podcast about knitting? Am I being affected by that pressure? Oh my goodness, who'd have thunk? I hope I haven't. I need my knitting to remain the comfort and the joy and the non-work that it is. Um, but I feel like I'm reaching for more things to have on my needles now when in the past I would do one project, finish it, block it, wear it and then cast on the next thing. So there's a question for all of you other knitting podcasters out there. Has your podcasting turned you into a multi-project knitter? Hmm. And why? There's a much more interesting question is the why. So now we are carrying on to the winner announcement segment of the podcast. Okay, first off, before I announce the winner, I need to thank every single one of you who left the most heartfelt sharings in episode 10, in the comment field of the episode 10, where you shared the stories of your knitting stories, your knitting journeys, how you began knitting, the way you use knitting to connect to your ancestry and to your heritage and to your family lines, the ones who came before you, 
the way, you know, those magical ways in which knitting has arrived in your life, the way it makes you feel connected to that pool that, of memory and heritage that came before you. So many of you shared so openly and with such feeling and genuine, genuineness, <laughs> just such authenticity. You have humbled me with how openly you have shared and how deeply you have shared. And I just want to thank you because I have spent the, the most beautiful December reading through every single one of your comments and being amazed and brought to tears often. And I have responded to every single one of your comments, I believe, unless of course you uh, left comments in the last two or three days, I probably haven't got to them, but if not, the vast majority of comments I have responded to. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I encourage you please to go back to episode 10, even if just to read the comments. It is a treasure trove of stories of knitting and heritage and ancestry and traditions and cultures and the way in which fiber, the way in which wool and knitting and working with our hands just connects all of those elements into one life and enriches that life in ways that we can't really even express in words. So thank you so much. And if you, like I said, if you haven't read it, just go and just trust me, just read through all the comments. It's beautiful. Um, it will, uh, you will be left feeling deeply touched and enriched. I know it just as I have been. So thank you so much. And there were two overarching themes that came from these stories that I wanted to touch on because this whole issue of heritage and ancestry and connecting through to it through your hand work is something that's very close to me. I am extremely protective of my own culture and my country and uh, the heritage, the phenomenal uh, millennia old textile heritage that I come from in South Asia. And because of that protectiveness, that because of that deeply rooted way in which I work in my own artist's work as well, and deeply rooted in my culture, in a you know very in, in a way that gives me a lot of strength, a lot of clarity, a lot of purpose and vision in my life is fueled by my love for the land that I was born on, the place, the people, the culture, all of it. And because of that, people who feel the same way and people who bring that into their work, I instantly feel connected to, you know? And I feel that, especially in the world we live in today, it is so important to preserve culture, to preserve the diversity on this planet, is to preserve what you firstly belong to and to bring that down into the next generations, whether it's through your own children or through the people who you come into contact with or whatever. That part is, you can tell, it, I am very passionate about that. I'm driven by that in many senses. So um, the two overarching themes that came up was that knitting and crafting uh, often was seen as a doorway into discovering more about your own heritage. There were so many stories of people not having had much of an idea of where their ancestors came from, especially if you are from, uh, you know, descended from immigrants. You know, I'm an immigrant in this country, a very recent one. And I had, there were so many sharings from people who were here as they were descended from other immigrants who did not have much of an idea of their own ancestry, but because of finding knitting or because of finding quilting or crochet or sewing or something that opened a doorway for then for you to investigate more about your own ancestry and i think that's a beautiful gift that things like knitting crafts like knitting can give you um, another theme was that often uh, these connections of craft and ancestral craft and ancestral connections found, seems to have found many people in times of great hardship and times of sort of turbulence in your life. There were so many stories of people finding knitting, or does knitting find you, just when you need it. And that opens the door to your family history, to your heritage, and how all of that, that adventure holds a human being through a uh, a period in your life that is otherwise surrounded by turbulence and hardship and uncertainty. There is this one root of, this one strong root of 
certainty when it comes to the memory of your ancestor and that tangible manifestation of it in your hands through knitting or working with wool or fabric or fiber how that becomes this one you know stable point as the storm rages around you yeah it's beautiful <laughs> i just wanted to touch on those two because they kept coming up for me um in in the stories that you shared so let me uh, sh share with you or announce to you the name of the winner of this giveaway. And there we go. So the winner of the giveaway for the last episode, the giveaway of the Nordic Knitting Primer by Kristen Drysdale. The winner's name is Maria Ramage, and I really, really hope that I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I apologize if I'm not. She writes, Maria writes, I am Scottish, living in the beautiful coastal Georgia of the United States. My grandmother was an avid knitter who lived in the Orkney Islands during her married life to a minister. Sadly, I never learned to knit from her. My fondest memories, fondest memories of her was watching her knit with great speed with one of her needles tucked under her arm. I came to my own knitting practice here in Georgia and I'm intrigued by the knitting practice of using a Mackin belt as used by the Shetlanders and the terrible knitters of the Dales in England. Many of the Shetland knitters even knitted while walking with the ball of yarn attached to their soul. Isn't that fascinating? Um, I am drawn to rustic yarns, tweedy looks and natural dyes, very much like me, uh, from lichens, which I suspect hearken to the dyes the Scots use to make their tweeds. Isn't that wonderful? Um, Maria, you are the lucky winner of the Google Random Number Generator. And um, I will get this wonderful book, this incredible resource out to you as soon as possible. And if you thought that that story was beautiful, that comment field in the previous episode is full of them. That's what, what's what I mean. Just, just go have a read. It's wonderful. Now, moving on to the next part of the podcast, we have another giveaway to start. I want to celebrate uh, reaching 4K subscribers on YouTube. And in order to celebrate that, this giveaway, the, whoever wins the prize will get two prizes. The first prize is this beautiful, uh, let's call it a project purse. It's made, it's something I made myself. It's made out of my own eco printed and indigo dyed fabric, some hand woven fabric handwoven sari fabric which has also been dyed in indigo more handwoven fabric dyed in indigo and it is quilted so it's quite a soft and squishy bag and there's some free form quilting on this panel here it's hand sewn by me and it is lined fully lined inside with more handwoven fabric uh, cotton fabric so a lot of handwork has gone into this. It is a delightful little thing. You could use it as a project bag, a project purse. Uh, you could use it as a makeup holder, makeup bag, anything. You could hold small skeins of yarn, whatever. It's, it's lovely. Um, and I want one of you to be able to win this along with. So along with this, you will also receive three free patterns of your choice by Kristen Drysdale um, of Scandi work. She was very kind to, um, when I told her that I was reviewing her book and giving it as a giveaway, she was so kind as to offer one of my viewers um, three free patterns of their choice. So I am making that as part of this giveaway as a little bundle, three patterns and a project purse. So let's get on to the rules of the giveaway. To be able to enter into the giveaway, please, you need to be a subscriber of Wool in the Forest on YouTube. So a subscriber of this channel. Um, I wanted to mention that because in the last giveaway, many people left comments uh, joining into the giveaway, but had not subscribed to the channel. So I couldn't enter you into the giveaway. So make sure you subscribe. You need to like this video and leave me a comment. In that comment, please use the hashtag, hashtag 4K giveaway. And in your comment, 
tell me about your knitting dreamings for this season. So whatever your knitting plans, ambitions, visions, dreamings, even if none of them come true, what do you really hope or want to achieve this season with your knitting? Um, again, if you missed any of that, all the rules for the giveaway will be in the description box below and we will draw the winner in the next episode. Um, yeah, so join in if you are at all interested. So what else do we have? I think that's it for the day. Oh, yarn arrivals. Oh my goodness, almost forgot to mention. I have some gorgeous new unspun yarn that has arrived from Germany. This is what I mentioned in the last episode of the podcast, uh, that they was coming all the way from Germany. These beautiful plates, I have two more each of these, but these beautiful plates of unspun deliciousness has come from Woolen Twine Fiber Studio in Germany. And um, it says here that it has been ethically sourced and minimally processed everything I love, respecting natural resources and keeping the process as sustainable as possible. And the unspun wool is made out of a blend of one, two, three, four, five different local sheep breeds, so local to the creator of this wool. Um, and it is uh, custom spun at a family run mill. I can't tell you how much I adore this unspun, everything about the way it's been made, the, the careful sourcing, the using of a small local mill, the using of local breeds, highlighting those local breeds. It's just everything that I am behind and fully supportive of. And the colors are natural. So these are undyed plates of unspun wool and they have a quality to them that I have difficult to explain because I haven't met it in any other unspun wool, not even in my absolutely beloved Plotilope, the Icelandic, which has a lot of strength. It is by far the strongest unspun wool that I have worked with. And it's not necessarily that strength, but it has an almost elasticity. It has a bounce, a spring to it, which is it's quite amazing really in an unspun wool. So I am very excited to um, bring this to life in a garment. I'm entirely unsure yet what it's going to be, but I have this urge to cast on immediately, which I'm resisting because I do have some other things I want to do first. And I want to let this just sit and really talk to me and let me know what it wants to be. And this color is specific. I mean, they're both gorgeous. This one is called linen. This one is called rye, very appropriately named, I think. And the linen is especially beautiful because all the way running through the entire, uh, um, unspun plate are these beautiful flecks of copper is all I can it's the best way I could describe it flecks of copper through this OT linen uh, base natural sheep's color it is quite magnificent and to see that come alive in a knitted fabric oh my goodness I'll stop <laughs> too much. Beautifully parceled. I am very happy with these. So um, definitely once I make my way through these, I will be getting more from Wool & Twine Fiber Studio in Germany. So um, yeah, and that's, that's all the yarn acquisitions arrivals and I will not be buying any more yarn uh, or wool for some time until I have worked my way through this lot and also some of my Nutiden because um, I'm very much, um, I wouldn't say a believer, but we, we live very much uh, according to an ethos of careful, conscious consumption and taking away the focus from consumption into actually like making do with what you have, using what you have, using things up, um, not simply buying for the sake of buying and very, consciously stepping away from a consumer driven mold mode of operating and living life into a uh, sort of I have enough I am enough and I can do enough with what I have that if, if I'm explaining that well enough for you to understand anyway so yeah we've we've covered everything I want to now 
Let's do a little bit of knit and chat before I leave you um, and catch up over our December period. So like I said, oh my my, December has been so very busy. Um, it has probably been the busiest December I've had in years. Vlogmas has been wonderful. Um, I don't know if any of you caught my Vlogmas videos, but many of you did. So I thank each and every one of you who followed along in my Vlogmas adventures, my very first Vlogmas on YouTube. It was such fun and making those videos, they enhanced my, really uplifted my experience of this uh, December solstice and New Year's period. And so if you haven't watched them, please do go and have a look. I'll link them at the end of this video too, so you can go and catch up on my Vlogmas uh, videos if you like, my Vlogmas offerings. So that was keeping me busy and of course, oh my goodness, all the baking and the making. You know, I think I have not in my life baked as many trays of mince pies <laughs> as I have this Christmas season. Goodness, I think in all together, I made about six trays of mince pies. I've never had to do that. My family is growing and the ones who are in it are growing so fast that they can just, they can eat me out of house and home now. So I was making and baking all month long. And of course, it's also my daughter's birthday and we make a big deal out of it, out of our little one's birthdays. We do a whole birth month. We call it the birthday month celebration where we spread everything out over a month and treat them finely. And yeah, it's just been so full, so busy, but so wonderful as well. We've had so much snow. Have you had snow where you are? Um, let me know, you know, um, leave me a comment. You know, I, I wanted to tell you that I read every single one of your comments and I actually do try to answer every single one of them. And I'd love to hear how your December was, how your Christmas and solstice celebrations were. Did you have snow? And if you did, was everything okay? Because I know in the east of the country, people have just been getting hammered. We were not hammered. We just got the best of the winter snow and we uh, went to sleep on solstice night with snow already on the ground and then when we woke up in the morning the morning of the shortest day going into the shortest um, into the new sun returning and we woke up and it was snowing it was just beautiful and I captured some of that in the final Vlogmas episode, Vlogmas uh, number three. So you can see some of those sights. So we've really enjoyed it. All the snow has now melted and we're kind of going through a bit of a warmer period, a warmer spell. Um, but let me know how yours has been. And I do love to know what your uh, winter knitting plans are. You know, I gain a lot of inspiration and ideas of my own from listening to all of you to re of reading your comments and seeing what you're working on and gives me a lot of joy so please do um, feel free to share because i read them all and i often often always respond to all of them so yeah so that's been us and now <laughs> i am going to bid you adieu farewell goodbye until next time and I hope again, um, leave you with the same greeting that I started with, that I wish you and yours a very blessed new year. May it be safe, uh, may it be full of happiness and quiet joys and simple things. I hope you find the clarity in your life to enjoy and embrace everything you already have because so many of us simply have enough. There are many who don't. There's so many people in the world who simply are struggling for the basic parts of survival, you know. I grew up in a place uh, which, which, in which I saw that firsthand. I grew up in the middle of a war, you know. I'm a war child. I come from a, came from a, uh, I was born into a war-torn country and I lived through most of my youth uh, in a war-torn country. So I know what it's like to see real suffering and hardship. And knowing that, I am so grateful for what I have now, incredible amount of gratitude. And I know that so many of us in this Western part of the world have so much more than we actually know. 
And I hope that in this new year, you are able to embrace all of that, to be grateful for it and to know that you have enough, you are enough. And that the more gratitude you feel for it, the better everything becomes for yourself and for everyone around you. Living a simple life and living it well. That's where it is, isn't it? <laughs> I wish you all the joys of a simple life. Bye-bye. See you next time.